Oh yes, we are finally at a point where Ken Wheeler describes the definition of a magnet. Now, I'm really super excited as I cannot wait to hear what wisdom he has to share with us. Okay, so let's go on to uh, section four of my lecture on uh, defining a magnet. Something basically everybody in the world thinks already been defined, but that would be incorrect in the extreme. Nobody has an idea what the hell's going on. I love it when people tell me, well, Tesla or Schauberger or so-and-so figured this out. It's like, go find me where they say that. And of course, nobody ever does. So, <laughs> here we actually see, uh, looking at one quote-unquote pole of a magnet, and uh, importantly, this is not only visible underneath the supercell, it is absolutely testable with any Gauss meter that you actually have a high pressure zone in the center. Let's have a look at that. No, that is not the pole of a magnet. That is a skirmion, which is funny because in part two, you said this. And uh, this is another particle fantasy to define magnetism. Such skirmions are quasi-particles. They do not exist in the absence of a magnetic field. So here's another unicorn particle. Once again, this is not part of any experimental input or output. It's just, it is literally a brain fart like unicorns or leprechauns. <laughs> Smooth. Intermediate pressure, and then we actually have a high pressure along the edge of the magnet. It doesn't matter what shape it is, cylinder, block, makes no difference. In your world, what does pressure mean? Um, what a Gauss meter can't tell you, however, is the nature of that flux. I mean, it'd be like uh, a meter not being able to tell you the difference between water coming out of your shower head or the water flowing down your, down your drain. One is wholly different than the other. One is centrifugal and force, the water hitting your face, for example. What? The force of the water hitting you in the face is centrifugal. I'm starting to understand what your problem is. You don't understand words. Analogously, and the water that's uh, going down the drain, of course your drain doesn't have suction on it, but imagine if it did, that uh, it is leaving, it is uh, increasing uh, to acceleration. It's uh, centripetal and increasing inertia and acceleration, whereas the water coming out of your shower head would be centrifugal and divergent. Okay, yeah, he definitely does not understand words. Here in the case on the side of each and every magnet, this is not my premise, this isn't theory or speculation, this is a hardcore damn fact. We have the interlacing between the centrifugal divergent and the centripetal convergent, and the pressure mediation between the two. This is undeniable. I deny that so-called fact. First, explain what centripetal, centrifugal, convergence, and divergence mean in your world. Then, explain how that statement makes sense with whatever nonsense definitions you are using. Then, demonstrate it through observation or experimentation. The undeniable fact line that he uses is designed to assert his dominance over the audience. And it really just means, well, I made a statement which is true. Don't worry your pretty little head about fact checking. I promise that it really is true. Now, I know that some people might find my channel a bit maths heavy. And the Flat Earthers will actually claim that I do this to boost my credibility and just bamboozle people. But actually, it is the opposite. I am well aware that my use of maths has actually hindered the growth of my channel as it limits accessibility. I've always tried my best to script the videos in such a way that you can follow them without having to understand the maths and sometimes are more successful than others. If I wanted to bamboozle my audience with bullshit then I wouldn't be doing this. It hinders my channel's growth and also limits my ability to actually bamboozle people. The thing with maths is that it is exact, it is testable. Every equation I show on screen can be tested and 
can be corrected. So instead of bamboozling my audience, I'm actually giving you all the opportunity to hold me accountable and do some fact checking. And this also explains absolutely every oddball phenomena that people are unable to comprehend. Why, for example, like the uh, world or the universe's most diamagnetic elements, say bismuth, for example, it uh, will, uh, is repelled by the edge of a magnet, but it will actually accelerate. And you can actually feel it attracting, or actually accelerating towards the center. Why, I thought uh, diamagnetic means hates magnetism. It should be repelled from whether it's the edge or the center. Not the case at all. What? Like it does here? Smooth. So uh, let's uh, talk about uh, this and uh, go over uh, magnetism. What is a magnet? Well, oh, here it comes, people. This is going to be the bit that wins Ken the Nobel Prize. Specifically in this uh, fourth section. You should have listened to Eric Dollard uh, when he said that you cannot understand electrical theory without a firm grasp of counter space. It is absolutely impossible without it. These are his words, not mine. Okay, so it is impossible to understand this without an understanding of counter space. Then, just from an educational perspective, would it not make sense to take a moment to actually explain what counter space is? There's a quote from Nikola Tesla. There is no energy in matter other than that which it receives from its environment, as meant the ether, of course, the medium or substrate. So you use that quote incorrectly to not actually back up your point. Tesla said that as part of his objection to the new physics that was being developed at the time, namely special relativity. But guess what? He was wrong. And of course it doesn't matter if we use the word zero-point energy or vacuum energy or the ether or uh, dark matter. I, I don't care. Mother Nature doesn't give a damn about what stupid, petty, dumb human beings call something. It's, we're referring to one thing and one thing only. But no, all these things are very different concepts. So before beginning to define the magnet, there is only one field, the ether, and its most basic manifest field is the dielectric. All other fields are merely geometric modality expressions of the one field. Retroductive platonic logic necessitates this to be so, since at the center of a magnet, for example, there is no magnetism. The center of a mass of gravity, there is no gravity. At the center of a dielectric field, however, there is the highest concentration of same. Today we are going to make a quick no fuss salad dressing which is fresh, summery and versatile. This one is really quick to whip up and it doesn't take any ingredients that the avid cook wouldn't have in their cupboards anyway. With this one we start with some dried mixed herbs, a bit of salt and some pepper. We then take some extra virgin olive oil and add a splash of red wine vinegar. We finish this up with a tiny dash of lemon juice and you can use fresh or just the bottled stuff you find in the baking aisle of your local supermarket. This dressing will go well with summery salads or just to spice up some mixed leaves, but my absolute favorite is to pair this with a good hearty word salad. So let's get to it, and I'd like you to take a look at this lecture long, I mean this image, excuse me, <laughs> long and hard, and uh, let's explain it here in just a second. So let's get to it. First, let's define a magnet and state the obvious, that before becoming a magnet and after becoming a magnet, there is zero quantitative change, be it ferrite, samarium, cobalt, neodymium, iron, boron, or otherwise. Zero quantitative change. But if a lump of, say, iron is in a demagnetized state and magnetic domains are not aligned, then there is no stray field. When the material is saturated, there is a stray field. We can quantify this field. Therefore, there is quantitative change. We can measure this. For example, we can take a hysteresis loop. Magnetodielectric elasticity, so to say, or the atomic and molecular nature of the object defines its ability to become a magnet. As has been demonstrated, we can polarize strawberries and living frogs in a strong enough magnetic field, really high magnetic field, but only temporarily so. Most neodymium magnets, for example, are magnetized with 2400 volts and 12 amps DC. For thousands of years now, we've been certain that magnetism was the reason why they, uh, these magnets accelerate towards one another. But this is not true at all and an absolute logical impossibility. How is that logically impossible? That's a very big claim that you should really back up. 
In the manifestation of the conjugate magnetodielectric field geometry, magnets accelerate towards a mutual null point or nexus in counter space, not towards each other. This is clearly also seen underneath the uh, ferrule cell. Null point? Do you mean equilibrium? Probably not, as you seem to be talking about a nexus in counter space. It would really help if you defined what counter space is, but as you're using the word nexus, I can only assume that it is a network of some sort. On the right, I'll take a, you'll have a look at this diagram in uh, other places. This is uh, from uh, Charles Proteus Steinmetz's uh, field diagram of, uh, of uh, the AC circuit, the, uh, the electrical circuit. And here we're looking at the circular lines. This is one where he gets it right. I hope you notice this pattern. We'll talk about it here shortly as well. This would be uh, also the same diagram, the field diagram between uh, the dielectric uh, manifest in blue and the magnetic in these uh, circular orange circles. This is the same uh, field you see in AC power lines going down your street. Okay, let me help you with that. I think that this is the image that he is referring to here. The solid lines are magnetic field lines and the dashed lines are the supposed dielectric field lines. Now, if I were to actually take the same field diagram and put a black box around it, okay, we have the exact same conjugate magnetodielectric hyperboloid and torus. By the way, the inverse of a torus is a hyperboloid. The inverse geometry of a, of a uh, hyperboloid meaning an hourglass shape, is a torus. These two superimposed upon each other, of course, form a sphere. Really? Let's check that. Here's a torus, here's a hyperboloid. And here they are when you add the two together. Or perhaps you meant it in another way. So here I repeat that in CSG scripting. And this is what you get. Not exactly a sphere. Is there something that I'm missing? the torus, the donut shape, and the hyperboloid, the hourglass shape. These are negative images of each other. It is also the case that the maximum, and this has been proven by supercomputer model, where you turn a sphere inside out to its maximum, the absolute inverse of a sphere is a hyperboloid. But hold on. Just a minute ago, you said that the inverse of a hyperboloid is a torus. Surely, if the inverse of a sphere is a hyperboloid, then the inverse of a hyperboloid should be a sphere. Which one is it? Everything that defines force in motion, space, force vectors, is magnetism. You remember when your idiot teacher said, every atom in the universe is 99.9999999999% empty space. Like, if we were to take all the empty space in every atom away, like the entire Earth would fit into something about the size of a uh, large marble. Well, it's not empty space at all. It's just the magnetodielectricity, or the air in the balloon, if you will, of every atom measured in picometers, the inner atomic molecular radii of any and every atom in the universe. That is magnetodielectricity. Hold on. Magnetodielectricity has dimensions of distance. That is the air, if you will, or the so-called space that uh, is... Uh, that uh, makes up the uh, molecular, uh, excuse me, the atomic uh, diameter in picometers, measured in picometers of each and every atom. An atomic radius is magnetodielectricity. What? But here we have the exact same diagram between these two. The field geometry is 100% identical. You should actually study on this. If you were to actually study on this, you'd make uh, an interesting uh, visual connection to what the hell is going on. Yeah, it would be great to study this. I'm sure that this will be subject of interest for a lot of mental health professionals in the very near future. By the way, if aliens, and I'm only saying this, not talking about aliens at all, if aliens were to land to prove that alien, uh, uh, us stupid human beings are even slightly evolved, we wouldn't have to show them anything or like, all we'd have to show, do is show them this diagram. I said, oh, these human beings, they, they understand the nature of the universe. But aliens will never land on this planet. They have seen your videos and thought, fuck it, there's nothing there. This is the uh, conjugate magnetodielectric geometry of the entire universe. Here we have the torus and the inverse image. We actually have the hyperboloid. Anyway, I could actually discuss that for hours. That is a long discussion to, uh, to talk about that one. Please don't. Here we have actually a frog levitating in an ultra high. I think it's like a six Tesla Gauss field, a living frog. Is it six Tesla or six Gauss? Which one? There's a big fucking difference.
By the way, it was 16 Tesla. Um, so people don't realize that all is the field itself. Just as magnets do not accelerate towards one another, neither is there anything present in the void of a ring magnet. Yet when viewing same underneath a supercell, it has the exact same magnetodielectric image as any pole of any magnet. Um, take a look and discuss this one here uh, shortly. It might be simple to think of a magnet which has been charged with 2400 volts and 12 amps DC as a permanent field photograph of the charge which has passed through it. The magnetodielectric geometry that defines a magnet is point source, not merely domain alignment. Descriptions are not explanations to say that a magnet is an object which has aligned domains is a superficial farce which neither explains what a magnet is nor how a magnet works. So you know the correct definition then, but you are choosing to ignore it even though we can directly observe that it is correct. I'm assuming it is because you don't understand what a magnetic domain is. So let's get down to the basics. Electrons have an intrinsic property called spin, and there's a magnetic field associated with it. The way that orbitals in an atom are filled means that they have a net spin and they produce a small magnetic field. However, these atoms can orientate themselves in random directions, and that results in a field due to each atom being cancelled out by the others. However, in some materials like nickel, iron, and cobalt, the spins don't randomly orientate themselves, and there's an interaction between adjacent spins which results in their alignment. And this interaction is called the exchange interaction, and it leads to regions in a magnetic material called magnetic domains. In these domains, they're all aligned, and this alignment results in a large magnetic field, and there's energy associated with magnetic fields. Therefore, you will find in a magnetic material, in a demagnetized state, that even though the individual spins in a domain are aligned to their neighbors, the magnetization of a whole domain is orientated to actually minimize the magnetic field produced by the material. As there are lots of domains, this results in the magnetic fields being canceled out. But this is until you apply an external magnetic field to the material. Then all the domains start aligning themselves to the magnetic field, or at least the domains which are in line with the external field grow at the expense of others. Once they are all aligned, the material will actually generate a magnetic field in itself. And you can switch off the external field, and this magnetic field will stay there. And these spins will stay aligned. This is because it actually costs energy for the magnet to go back to the ground state. And this is because of domain walls, which are regions which separate the domains, cost energy to create. And this presents an energy barrier preventing the material to get back to the ground state. If this barrier is high enough, then you've just made a permanent magnet. Now, I've shown it as a diagram here, but here is the process observed with a Kerr microscope. This is an explanation of how permanent magnets form. Now, Ken Wheeler made a 28-minute video on what defines a magnet. We are nine minutes in, and he got half a sentence right, but then fucked it up with the second half. It has been on my to-do list for a long time, but I never really have gotten around to creating this for YouTube, but I hope to be doing a proper series on magnetism at some point in the future. Once again, I will cut it here as we are about halfway through the video and you all really have better things to do with your life. We will pick this up again very soon. So with that, see you in a few days.